fellowship of your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Just for a moment, before we get into the teaching of God's word, that there are fears that exist, and they are all around us and within us, but God's word says that his perfect love casts out all fear. So right now, wherever there's a fear 
that you can name it right now. You're like, yep, that's a fear that I have. It's a fear that I'm living in. It's a fear that I contend with and battle with. Let's know that God's battling on your behalf. He's battling on our behalf. Let's sing that chorus one more time to know that our fight is in the spiritual realm and that God has already overcome the victory. So let's sing that. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to every fear and every fear I lay at your feet. And I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs. Every fear and every fear I lay at your feet. And I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Amen. Yeah. Why don't you guys take a moment? You know, the shalom of God, his peace, his shalom is the peace that everything in the world is right in, when it's in God's order. Let's extend the peace of God to our neighbor. Just say, may the peace of God, the shalom of God be with you. And kids, you are now released to your home, to the other side of the room. Good morning. Whoa, that's loud. Okay. Good, good morning, Reality Santa Barbara. I'm so glad to have you here with us today, whether you are checking us out for the first time or you are back for the first time in a long time or you're watching outside or you're watching online because your name is Dylan. What's up, Dylan? Uh, we are so glad to have you here. Um, in case we haven't met, uh, those who know me call me Ariel because that is my name. Those that do not know me, probably know me as reality's worst greeter. Now, I do want to take a moment just to clarify why that is the case, because it can be confusing. You come to church, they're standing outside, hi, welcome to reality, hi, welcome to reality, and I'm standing behind them with my arms crossed, like, what's up? And <laughs> I've had some awkward interactions with people. I currently serve on the security team, so we don't have uniforms and wear the same badge, but I'm not on the green team, I'm on the security team. So if you see me standing in a corner by myself brooding over the church, it's because I'm working, okay? That there's nothing wrong. I'm not even working, I'm volunteering. They won't pay me. You know, I, I asked several times. Um, but that's what's going on with me. Um, I have been going to this church for a very long time. I've been here since uh, the City College days. And uh, all that to say, I am really excited about what God's doing at this church currently. Um, we are growing, uh, we are getting to know each other, and so I just want to take some time to tell you about a couple things that are happening in the life of our church right now. Uh, the first and foremost, Summer Community Nights. Now, if you've been going, go ahead and raise your hand. All right, well, do I have to pitch it if, they all, if they're all there? <laughs> um, a lot of you have been going, and it has been awesome. Um, it's from Wednesdays from 6 to 8 p.m. here in this building. Uh, do we share a meal together? Yes, check. Um, do we laugh together? Depends on the table you sit at. But for the most part, yes. Um, is there childcare? Yes. Um, do we talk about God and what he's called us to be at our church? Yes. Literally the only thing missing at this point is you, right? So this is our pitch to get you to come join us. We're all here anyways. Just hang out one more day a week. I know you want nothing more than to see us more than you already do. So um, we are excited about that. Um, and just to review, food, word of God, all expense paid trip to Hawaii, okay? <laughs> Community Nights has two of these things. If you haven't been coming, 
You don't know which two they are. So I invite you to come, find out what we got going on there. We look forward to seeing you there on Wednesday. Newcomers, if you haven't been yet, you can still sign up. So go to realitysb.com or follow the link on our Instagram bio, and we would love to have you join us. Secondly, Night for the Nations. Uh, if you haven't heard about it already, uh, Reality has always had a big heart for uh, missionary work and the nations. We support eight different local international outreach and missionary works around the world. So eight different ones. On July 12th, we have a special opportunity, and that is to hear from our ministers in, uh, who are working at a family of churches in Turkey called Lighthouse Church. Uh, it's led by Ali and Kaylee Ozturk. You're probably familiar with them at this point, but you get to hear an extended version of what, the, what God's been doing in their ministry. Um, and it's gonna be incredible. The gospel's gonna be discussed. Uh, you can see where your investment has been going. A lot of you guys have been investing financially or emotionally or spiritually through prayers. So it's just a chance to get uh, an extended format exposure to them and get some of your questions answered and maybe give them some encouragement and learn a thing or two. So that will be again on July 12th. Uh, more details about that will be announced soon. Today, Stephen is going to be continuing our series, Restore My Soul, A Summer in the Psalms. And before we bring him up, I would like to invite up Asha for the reading of God's word out of Psalm 42. Asha, take it away. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go to be Go to the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of sitting under the teaching of your word. Thank you for preserving these psalms for us. Thank you that it is your desire uh, that we prosper and be in health, even as our soul, proud and meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do today. Minister to the hearts and minds, the bodies, the lives, the imaginations of the people who are within the sound of my voice, both here in the room, online, listening to the podcast later. Be glorified, Lord Jesus. You are our Lord. We declare the Lordship of Jesus over this space, over this time. And Lord, we just ask you to do what only you can do. Bring restoration to our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. As the deer pants for the flowing stream, so my soul longs for you, O oh God. Maybe you've sung these words a time or two before. Maybe you old school Christians uh, like me can't help but think of Maranatha's world famous 1984 
worship hit. If you know it, sing the King James Version with me. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth. It's just more spiritual if it's got the King James eth, long eth for you. Uh, down through the years, dozens of songwriters and worship leaders have been inspired by the opening of Psalm 42. There's something intimate sounding about uh, those words. and something that kind of captures your imagination about this spiritual person who's longing to be with, to think about what's really happening in this psalm. Well, we're going to do that together. First, let's talk about deer. A deer panting. Deer are not stupid animals. They don't wait until they're just desperately thirsty, dying of thirst, to go get water. They take care of themselves. They know where the stream is. They bed down close to the stream, so they know where the water source is. Artfully prancing across the picturesque landscape toward a serene, bountiful water source. Then we might imagine the deer slightly out of breath, calmly bowing down for a cool, refreshing drink. That's how we long for God. That's how the psalmist wants us to picture us longing for the presence of God. But is that what Psalm 42 is really saying? Come now. Have you ever actually heard a deer? How many of you have heard a deer? What sound does a deer make? Well, when a deer is panting for the water, deer don't sing, they snort, they howl, they blow, grunt, bleat, and wheeze, and it's not particularly melodious. The sound of a deer barking in the woods, probably worth the YouTube search, it's downright creepy. You know how cute it is when your little puppy huffs and puffs and pants, running around circles in the living room? A deer panting is not like that. When a deer really pants, it looks like it's on death's doorstep. He may stick out his tongue, and sometimes his whole body just starts convulsing. It's not cute. It's not Beautiful. Now just imagine that deer is on the run from a predator, forced into the mountains for days. Now she finds herself far away from home, far away from any known water source. She's been barking and wheezing, and now she's at her wit's end, panting for water. What words would you describe to use how the deer feels in this situation? Disoriented? Desperate? Distressed, Psalm 42 says disquieted and downcast. Now you're beginning to get an idea of what as the deer pants for the water means. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. Last week we talked about the Hebrew word for soul. 10,000 points for the person who remembers the, wor- the, the word, the Hebrew word, for 10,000 points. Don't spend it all in one place. The word translated soul is the word nephesh, and it's not the way we think about the word soul. Our idea of the word soul has been influenced by Greek thought, and we kind of think of this disembodied, ghostly part of ourselves. It's this invisible part of ourselves. And though the Hebrew word nephesh does include that part of you, There's something different about the word nephesh. The nephesh in the uh, scope of Hebrew scripture is whole life, whole self, whole body, whole mind. As the deer pants for the flowing streams, the psalmist says, so my whole self, my whole body, my whole life, my whole mind is in need of God. The psalmist is using the metaphor to say that he is desperate to hear from God. This is not about spirituality or self-help or life enhancement. This is not going from good to great. This is a life and death issue. The psalmist is feeling like he's grasping for air in a frantic search for the source of life. 
Verse 2 says, my soul thirsts for God, the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Have you ever found yourself in a state of anxiety or fear or worry such that it kept you up all night? Such that you were desperate for hope. Hope is hard to find in certain seasons or in certain inflection points in our life. Have you ever felt this way about your relationship to God? Have you felt like the presence of God could not be further away? Anxiety is an, at an epidemic state in our world. There's a, a, a thought within the leadership books that says that your systems are perfectly designed to give you the results you're getting. And in his book, A Failure of Nerve, uh, Dr. Edwin Friedman gives five characteristics of an anxious culture. See if it sounds like the culture that we live in right now or any culture that you're a part of. Maybe this is connected to a family culture that you know about or a work culture that you know about or a political culture that you're familiar with. Five characteristics of an anxious culture. The first is reactivity. Bouncing from anger to instant gratification. Instant gratification to anger. No happiness and sadness, no joy and sorrow, just instant gratification and anger. Reacting to everything that comes down the pike of your news feed. The second thing is this uh, being prone to a mob mentality, devolving from a, an autonomous person created in the uh, image of God to someone who is wondering what to think or, or needing someone to tell them what to think. The third thing is blame displacement. This is a retreat into victim status where the problem is always out there somewhere. It's always they and them. And, in, and we never have the capacity as individuals to step in, in in that image of God rulership and to do anything about it. The fourth thing is a quick fix mentality. We hear somebody has some um, half a lack of a well-differentiated leader. The presence of one well-differentiated leader and a well-differentiated leader would be someone who says, I see the event, I see the crisis, I, s I understand what you're going through, but your crisis, your anxiety does not have to be mine. That well-differentiated leader, one, the presence of one well-differentiated leader in a culture and a system has the ability as an expression of a well-differentiated leader. Well, wait a minute, he sounds pretty anxious to me. He sounds pretty worried to me. He sounds pretty emotional to me, the sons of Korah. That doesn't sound like a well-differentiated leader. What do you do when hope is hard to find? That's what this psalmist is presenting to us. Author and Christian thinker Thomas Merton said, the Psalms present the experience of men and women who have prayed in every conceivable circumstances across 30 centuries. The Psalms acquire for those who know how to enter them a surprising de depth, a marvelous and, ex and inexhaustible actuality. They are bred, you see, the psalmist in Psalm 42 is not just complaining and inviting you into his anxiety. He's pointing down a path to the way of Yahweh, to the way that leads to Jesus. In Psalm 42, though, we do get an intimate glimpse into a soul's pursuit of God's presence, not simply for enhanced spirituality, but a heart-wrenching cry for survival. Let's consider Psalm 42 as less a poetic contemplation and more of a primal scream for God alone. A primal scream for hope. This morning, I was out on the porch. Um, I was spending time in prayer and going over my notes and spending time with God. And just a little bit after the sun came up, I actually heard a primal scream. What are the chances 
I'm talking about this, and I hear someone give a horrifying scream. I got up from my seat, and I looked over the banister, and I saw and heard, well, first I heard a car screeching around the corner. <clears throat> this car uh, was skidding their tires. They, they were, uh, they were, they were uh, screeching to a halt. It was a start and stop kind of a thing, and it seemed very intentional. This wasn't a person learning to drive a stick shift. This was a person in desperate need, someone who was angry. The person behind the wheel was very intentionally doing what they were doing. I heard screams within the car, and then I, heard, then I saw the door fling open. Someone slammed the door while the car was moving, and the person just started running down the street below. The driver put the car in gear and hit the gas and started heading right toward the person who had just got out of the car. Skidding their tires and veering to barely miss this young man, a, vo a woman's voice, a young woman's voice rang out. She put the car into park, left the door open, left the car right in the middle of the road and started yelling screaming at this young man. But what I heard was not a scream of violence, but a scream, a desperate scream of heartache. Alex! She yelled. Why are you running away from me? Maybe because you're chasing him with a car? Why are you treating me this way? Sobbing, crying, yelling, all capital letters. Alex, where are you going? We were together every day. It doesn't have to end. It doesn't have to be her. Why can't it be us? It's like a movie. I wish someone had recorded it. I did record it. You can see me after service if you want to hear it. I really was concerned, though. My heart was beating out of my chest. I didn't know what was about to happen. Why don't you love me anymore, Alex? Why don't you care? It doesn't matter anymore, he says. It doesn't matter to you. It matters to me, she screamed. That's it, she says. I'm leaving. And so she runs and gets back in the car and slams the door and speeds off down the hill and leaves him walking. What's happening here? Alex was once the source of life for this young woman. And now it seems she seems to have lost, he seems to have lost that loving feeling. This young woman was devastated to the point that her anxieties and worries and fears had overtaken all of her senses. The only thing that mattered in that moment was winning back Alex, and yet she couldn't seem to find the way to get him back. She loved him so much it hurt. And for a moment, she thought, I, I thought this was going to be one of those if I can't be with you, no one can moments, but thankfully it was not. But I want you to put yourself in this young woman's shoes for a moment because I know you have. I know you've been there. Maybe it seems like a distant memory. There's something in, uh, that the sociologists call a, uh, uh, the curse of knowledge. The curse of knowledge is a pretty simple idea. It's just that once you have a certain kind of knowledge, a certain kind of experience, over time, you forget what it was like to be there. You forget what it was like to not know. The curse of knowledge is you can't remember not knowing. But if you'll take a moment, I think that you can see this heart cry is something that is true to humanity. It's more of the essence of Psalm 42 than you might have realized. As the deer pants for the water, as this young woman cries out for Alex, so my soul cries after you. 
Fortunately, this young woman calmed down, and she did leave Alex behind. Over the years, wise pastors and spiritual formation leaders have identified stages in the life of following Jesus. The first stage, struggle to get your life together is that first stage. In those early years, we set our imaginations on something somewhere out there. It's kind of a longing for this thing we call home. No matter how good your home life was, you can't help but long for a new home. No matter, uh, no matter how bad your home life is, you still have within your imagination the ability to conceive what the good life could be like. And you'll do almost anything to get there. And right about this moment in your life, in your young life, puberty hits with a kind of violent force that conspires to get you out there. When I was about 14 years old, we had this guy, Michael, come play basketball with us from down the street, Michael Lane. And Michael, like most of us Georgia kids, didn't really totally grasp the English language. Um, certain words were hard for us. And, uh, and so uh, Michael was 13 years old, and his voice was just starting to change. And so uh, his, his voice cracked, and it you think I'm going through poverty. I said, I think you mean puberty. He's like, that too. <laughs> puberty is a kind of poverty where we can't access the emotions we want. Or we have too much emotions that we don't want. Too the, the, the chemical imbalance is indicative of this soul cry. The struggle to get your life together. In that season, in that struggle, you essentially ask yourself three questions. Who am I? Who really loves me? And is everything going to be okay? Who am I? Who really loves me? And is everything going to be okay? What's at stake for this young woman and Alex? One of the reasons she's so filled with anxiety is that Alex represents all of those things. He was the answer to all of those things. At one point, she could say, who am I? I'm Alex's girl. Who really loves me? Alex. Will everything be okay? As long as I'm with Alex, everything will be okay. You parents know how difficult it is to help a young person navigate the troubled waters of unrequited love and heartbreak because very likely you've experienced it yourself. You want to reach in and save them. You want to rescue them. You want to pat them on the head and say, chin up, kiddo. It's all going to be okay. But look at the scene. Look at what the psalmist is saying. The deepest part of this young woman's soul was crying out, and it was a primal scream. How dare you suggest everything's going to be okay? Everything is not okay. The person surrounded by anxiety has that feeling. No, no, no. The soul your nefesh, it cannot be patted there, there. It's like a wild animal that has to be tamed. Its thirst cannot be quenched with platitudes and positivity. But the truth is, someday, we all know, someday she'll forget about Alex, won't she? Someday you'll forget about the thing that caused you so much anxiety. Maybe not fully, but mostly that's when we move into the next stage of this stage theory, and it's called the struggle to give your life away. We move from the struggle to get our life together to the struggle to give our lives away. And we never stop asking those three questions. Who am I? Who loves me? And is everything going to be okay? But the volume is turned down on those questions because we've made some pretty big life kids we have financial obligations. Now the struggle is different, but the primal scream is still there. Psalm 42, three says, my tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Inside the singular pain of unrequited love, in this, uh, instead of the singular pain of unrequited love, in this stage, our anxieties and fears and worries 
have to do with the struggle to give your life away. When your career stops loving you the way, when kids that we love and give our lives to begin to reject us, when the money we earn is not enough and the home we make is not enough, we're not yelling at Alex, why don't you love me? But tears have been our food. We hear the accusing voice saying, where is your God? Most of you know, I've mentioned this before, I'm a third generation pastor. My granddad was a larger than life figure. My dad was a local church pastor. I love them both dearly. But I left the roots of the United Methodist Church in rural South Georgia to move to the booming metropolis of Tulsa, Oklahoma. A million people in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I landed a job at a church called Church on the Move. It was bigger than anything I had ever seen before, and it really was an amazing growing church. I started as a volunteer, and they said, if you make yourself to where we can't do without you, we won't. And that's how I got my full-time job. Just this week, I got a notification on my phone. The anniversary of my ordination, 2004, my pastor, my hero, brought me up on stage, laid hands on me and said, we just, the ordination is just an affirmation of what God has already done in Stephen's life. My dad was there. My granddad wrote this big, long, amazing letter that still hangs in my office. It was bigger than anything I thought I could have ever had. This little podunk kid from Georgia is now a pastor at one of America's fastest growing churches. I am a pastor. And soon people started treating me with this honor and this respect. Hey, your name is being thrown around as a division leader, a potential division leader. You might be able to make more than $28,000 a year. That's what I thought. I don't know. There was no promise of the salary. That happened one time, two times, three times. Each time I was mentioned for a specific position, the person who got it, it was totally understandable. It was one of the pastor's sons, or this person moved over, and they're, they're, the person they were mentoring got the position. After several times of hearing, you're the next, you're the next, you're the next, I began to believe a lie that unless you are the next, what are you worth? And every time I got passed over, and every time things didn't go the way I thought they would, I heard this taunting voice, not directly, but indirectly saying, where is your God? Why so downcast, O oh my soul? Put your hope in God. You see, your anxiety and do something about it. Uh, Psalm 42 has within it the resources to take you to the very source of life, the source of water, the living water that the psalmist was looking for is actually on offer in this psalm. After several times of following down this path of you're not unless I almost lost everything. I almost gave away my entire church career because of this voice that said, where is your God? Eugene Peterson says, our prayers, whether clumsy or skilled, heretical or orthodox, verbatim or from the Psalter or ad lib from a sinking ship, get us no merit with God. But did you know that God hears anything you whisper or shout, say, or sing? Right words and correct forms are not a prerequisite to a heavenly audience. Do you know that? What's your relationship with prayer? If every time you hear someone pray, you hear eloquence, you're missing something. If every time you hear someone pray, that you, you think, man, that person is so spiritual, you're missing something. Prayer is 
fumble that. It's when you turn the, <coughs> pardon, you turn the edit position. <laughs> this cough is a prayer. <laughs> They're getting water for me. Oh, thank you, Grace. Prayer is when you turn the edit position off, the edit button off, and you allow your emotions, you allow your reality to be bare before God. You make yourself vulnerable before the God who created you. Our prayers, whether clumsy or skilled, heretical or orthodox, verbatim from a psalter or ad-libbed from a sinking ship. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Get us no merit with God. Right words and correct forms are not a prerequisite for heavenly audience. So what should you do? What is Psalm 42 prescribing? Well, Psalm 42 is honest. Why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. What do you do when hope is hard to find? What do you do when life seems to be conspiring against you, when the disappointments lead to frustrations and frustrations lead to anxieties? When your mind won't stop and your world seems to be taunting you. Two simple moves. The first is this. Locate the source of your anxiety. And the second is this. Relocate the source of your hope. And then relocate the source of your hope. If you're in the place where you're screaming out at God, or you're panting like the deer pants for the water stream. It means you have hope. If you have breath in your lungs, you have hope. Locate your anxiety. You know, they say the two most basic human emotions are I want or I fear. If you want to find the the place of your anxiety, the first place to look is not at your actual anxiety. You see, looking at your anxiety, looking at your worry is the thing that puts you in this spiral in the first place. It's the maddening thing that keeps you up at night. It's just, if you could just solve this problem, it's like a logic loop. This leads to this, leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. It just keeps going and going and going. You can't seem to turn it off. Well, how do you locate the source of your anxiety? Well, you have to move further upstream of the worry and the anxiety itself. Psalm 119 says, turn my eyes from worthless things. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 35 and 36 and 11 verse 1 says, therefore don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. (coughs) What is faith? Well, faith is the assurance of the thing that you hope for, the conviction of things not seen. (coughs) Confidence comes from God, yes, but it also comes from the community of the people of God. Did you notice in the Psalm, in Psalm 42, he said, how access to community? The confidence to to speak to your anxiety, to speak to your worry, to speak to your fear is, yes, it comes from God, but one of the resources he's given you is the people of God. Second, confidence comes from God through your own mouth. You know, Scripture tells us that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Why so downcast, O oh my soul? Why are you in turmoil? The late, great uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, stop listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. So locate the source of your pain. Talk to it. Talk to your Alex. Then hop in the car and drive away 
and leave your worries and fears. Even your short-sighted and temporal hopes and fear and dreams on the side of the road. You can speak to those things. Self, why are God? That's the second move. Relocate your hope. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans and, uh, that I have for you. This is the Lord's de- de- uh, declaration. Plans for your well-being, not your disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Psalm 62, 5 says, My soul, wait upon God, for my expectation is only from him. I'd like to invite the band to come. Have you located the source of your fears and your worries? Have you relocated your hope? If you have breath in your lungs and you are a child of God, you have access to the thing, the cure for your worries. Can you speak to those things? Yes. The psalmist says, soul, why are you so downcast? Put your hope in God. There was once one who had unbridled access to the throne of God, one who laid that glory aside, put on human flesh, one who called living water, another time found himself thirsty. I thirst, Jesus cried. The one who had access to all knowledge from all eternity past, lay aside that knowledge. Taking on human form, became a servant, yet we esteemed him smitten, afflicted by God. The one who knew God asked, Eloi, Eloi, lama sambaktani. He asked why. The one who had at one point had access to all knowledge, submitted himself to death, even the death of a cross, and yet asked why, as his enemies taunted him, saying, where is your God? What do you do when hope is hard to find? Well, the God of all creation made his dwelling among us. Jesus knew right where to locate his hope. Scripture tells us we should look unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, or you might say the hope that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. But where is he now? Sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Dear friends, don't you know? Don't you know that if you are in Christ, you are seated with him. Yes, you face the realities that cause you anxiety now, but your position is with him. Look to the heavens. Where does your hope come from? It comes from heaven. Yes, your relationships matter to God. Yes, your financial situation matters to God. Yes, the dreams you had for your family matter to God. Yes, your vocation matters to God. Yes, your physical health matters to God. But don't cast away your confidence. Put that confidence, set your hope in Jesus. You're seated with him. Put your hope there. How God has exalted Jesus and given him the name that is above every name. If you have breath in your lungs, you can call upon the name of Jesus. Romans chapter 15, verse 13 says this, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you stand with me? We're going to close this service in worship and responding to the God of hope and ask him to restore your soul. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace 
so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is my prayer for you. As always, we have carpets open for you to come, spend some time in prayer. If you have a heavy burden and you would like for someone to pray for you, our prayer partners will be over here to my right, your left. Don't leave without having someone agree with you in prayer for whatever your need is. If you would like to partake in communion, we have the elements up here as well. Let's worship God together. Let's put our hope in the God of hope. Oh God, my.
gonna let me down We believe it You're never gonna You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let Never gonna let me down You're never gonna let Never gonna let Never known a love like yours So intimate, so powerful And I've tasted and I've seen Nothing comes close I've never known a love like yours Jesus, your name Power is breath and living water. Your spirit guides me to the heart of the Father. Let your praise ring louder every day and every hour. Cause your spirit guides me to the heart of the Father. At home like this Just like a child So innocent And I'm safe inside your arms And you won't let go I've never known A love like yours psalm we're gonna speak to our soul and say soul I don't know if you feel like it or not but stepping into the waters of worship of the presence of God for our heart to follow so regardless of what you feel let's tell our soul tell your soul soul let's step into the presence of God and we're just gonna sing praise we sing praise Come on, so we sing praise to the God who never changes. 
We sing praise, yes we do. We sing praise, yeah we sing praise. We sing praise. We sing praise. And living water, yeah. Your spirit guides me to the heart of the, the truth. Let your praise ring louder every day and every hour. Cause your spirit guides me to the heart. Last time, Jesus, Jesus, your name's power. It's breath and living. Your spirit and your spirit guides me to the heart of the let our praise and let your praise ring louder every day and every hour Cause your spirit guides me to the heart of the father of it all Jesus you are worthy of it all for from you are all things to you are all things you deserve you deserve the glory there's no greater truth than that Oh, you are worthy of it all, worthy of our praise and affection. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the Our eyes are on you as we sing your word. You are worthy of it all. And you are worthy of it all. All our breath and our lives. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. of it all You are worthy of it all For from you are all things and to you are all things Oh, you deserve the glory Let's close with our voices now You are you are worthy of it all And you are worthy of it all No one more worthy For from you are all things Lord Jesus this morning in this gathering, the family where there's fear and regret and shame and doubt, desperation and depression, we say, soul, look to God. Soul, put your hope in Jesus, the God who will never fail. He'll never leave. He'll never forsake. Soul, this is the God who gave it all, the king who laid his life down, who bled for you. 
who knows you inside out, knew you in your mother's womb. It's calling you to a kingdom further up and further in. Soul, he's worthy of it all. He's worthy of it all. He's worthy of it all. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the inestimable worth of your presence. Thank you that in your presence is fullness of joy. Thank you that you give us the capacity, the ability, the agency, the power to speak to ourselves no matter what condition our circumstances are in, no matter where our mind and our souls are, we can speak to our souls and say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Bless every soul as we depart today. Now may the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go, ahead, go out and have a great week, and we'll see you soon.